Los Angeles. Now, as you know, in Los Angeles, the, the city has adopted a ban on July 24th. They voted for a ban. It was published uh, on the first Wednesday of this month, and it takes effect on September 6th. So that means, essentially, on September 6th, all the medical marijuana patients, cooperatives, and collectives in the city are illegal. The city attorney's office has already started sending letters to the property owners that collectives and cooperatives rent from, threatening them saying, hey, this is in fact, these places are illegal, you need to shut them down. And under the ban, the property owners can also be fined, as well as the collective operators. So it's really a, a nasty sort of time thing because it's not in effect, and it may never take effect. And so there are many reasons why the ban may not take effect. Uh, and so I asked Joe Elford, who's our chief counsel, to write a letter, which I just received this morning, and you can grab a copy if you like. This is a letter to the city attorney's office explaining why the ban should not be enforced even when it takes effect. Now, this is just us pushing back on now. This isn't a lawsuit. Yeah. It's just a letter from our attorney to the city attorney saying, hey, quit it. And basically what he says uh, in a nutshell is this. The Supreme Court's going to decide whether or not bans are legal. So moving ahead now with the ban in Los Angeles is a bad idea. It could result in confusion, litigation, and all of that. And besides that, we've got a voter referendum that's fully funded and on track to qualify. And so we're going to overturn this ban. And so it's disingenuous to say to a landlord that the ban is here to stay when we might overturn the whole thing in March anyway. And that is uh, all of the pre-moratorium, post-moratorium, good guys, bad guys, everybody's illegal together. And so uh, numerous people in Los Angeles are organizing efforts to try to fight back against that. We're organizing a voter referendum, and a voter referendum is a process where we gather signatures. Uh, we have to get 10% of the signatures cast in the last mayor's race in Los Angeles. And if we gather enough valid signatures, it goes to a vote of the people. The city council actually gets two choices. They can either just repeal the ordinance when we have the signatures, which would be nice of them, or they can uh, send it to a vote in March, March of 2013. Uh, the good news is, is that if they opt for a vote, instead of repealing the ordinance themselves, the ordinance goes on hold until the people vote in March of 2013. It may be that Absolutely. next Friday we're finished, which is awesome, and we can move on to something else. But uh, we, there, we don't want to wait for the last week and realize we only have 60%, so we need to know where we're at, for real. Uh, it's tell us that we need 45,000 signatures to be statistically certain to qualify for ballot. So that's our goal, is to put 45,000 signatures. We gather the signatures, we turn them in. The city attorney uh, is going to verify the signatures. After the city attorney verifies all the signatures and determines that we've met the requirement, then it goes to city council. And they have 20 days to decide whether or not they're going to repeal the ordinance or put this for a citywide vote. The grassroots in this process. Um, that that line is crucial because remember, we have to go to the voters and actually campaign for this. We're going to need a lot more money and a lot more effort, but we're going to need people to feel ownership. And if they sign their petition, they start to take ownership. It's a crucial aspect of the campaign. I've done these campaigns before, and nothing is more important. But I don't think that your best bet is to go out to shopping malls and grocery stores and bus stations unless you just really want to do it. And if you do, hit the road and do it. But I think what I need from you guys is to go get your friends and your family and your co-workers where you have access to them during the day, one-on-one, -on -one, all the time. Those are the people Petition Gathers aren't guaranteed to get, and they're the people we most need to buy in from. That's because everybody who signs the petition has to be given the opportunity to read it. Now, they won't read it. They will not read it, but it's important that they have an opportunity to read it. <coughs> It's also printed in two languages. It's printed in English and Spanish. So there are a lot of pages before the actual signature gathering that are just information. So you'll get back to page 16 before you see the place to sign the petition. There are four pages with ten places each for people to sign. The first three pages are printed in English. The fourth page is printed in Spanish. It does not matter if you, um, speak, if you speak English or Spanish which page you sign. It's just there for convenience. And so those are the signature pages, four pages of signature pages where people can sign. So 40 signatures per petition. 
So you can get up to 40, that's actually a lot. If you've uh, ever done this before, you know getting 40 signatures is, you know, is a task. Um, on the back is the affidavit. Do nothing with the affidavit until the book is full or you are finished. The back is where you're going to sign and say, I'm the signature gatherer who got these signatures. Even though you're not paid, you still have to sign the affidavit. Um, and it's very, very important that if you sign the affidavit that you're eligible to vote. Um, now, mind you, with the signature gatherers, you actually don't have to be registered. You just have to be eligible. Well, this is a legal document. And the only people who can sign this are people who are registered to vote in the city of Los Angeles. If they're not registered to vote or they don't live in LA, they should not sign this petition. It actually does more harm than good. Criteria, registered to vote live in Los Angeles. Now, the other thing that uh, uh, we have to be careful of is duplications. If you sign twice and they find it, um, that counts as an invalid signature. This is very crucial. So if somebody's already signed the petition, take their word for it and move on because we don't want duplicates. Um, it should go without saying, but we also want their real name and address. Uh, I have seen things like Dopey McStoner at Hemp Hill. We need that real address, <laughs> and it can't be a PO box. So this is a uh, this is page 16 of your booklet. Um, you're going to notice a couple things up here. First, there are two co blank columns down the side here, and a blank column down the side here. All they're going to do is this middle part here: the name, signature, residence address. It says no PO box, city of zip. You actually don't have to put the state, but most people will do it anyway because they, of course, have it. There's a place for today's date. It needs to be on there. And then there's a place for their birth date. The birth date is used in the verification. It's just the, the month and day, and it is optional. Some people feel really funny about giving their birth date. That's okay. If they don't want to, they don't have to. And it says that at the bottom here, for month and day, maybe are solely used for facilitate verification. So that's all we need, just this center block filled in filled in by the person signing the petition, not filled in by you. This is for them to do with their hand. It's very important for legal purposes, but this be done in all different handwriting, otherwise someone can challenge it and say, hey, you made up those names. And if somebody is not registered to vote but wants to sign the petition, or if they don't know if they're registered to vote, we can just re-register them. Most of the stuff um, at the top of this form is just their name and address. Um, it even has a place where homeless people can describe, describe where they live if they don't actually have an address. Um, so really, it's just a matter of filling out the form. Um, the, new, so the new voter registration uh, forms do require that you either give your California ID or the last four digits of your social security number, one or the other. People may balk at that, and the truth is that they don't give one of those two things, they cannot be registered to vote. So, so you're going to let them fill out this form. Um, there, there are these options on here that you can register for a political party, you can put your email address, and uh, you can choose to have your ballot mailed to you. None of that's relative to us, so I want to point it out to anybody. If they want to do that, fine, but we just want to get them registered to vote at the address on the petition. So focus on getting them to complete the top part, uh, 1 through 11 here. And once they've completed 1 through 11, that's a ballot voter registration. The last thing to remember is they have to sign. They must sign down here saying that they're a U.S. citizen over 18 years of age. The important thing for you as a signature gatherer is to look at the registration number. Right down here, there's a red number. It's printed in red below the signature. This one says 421770. That number needs to go on your petition if you're registering a voter who signs the petition. The reason for this is because these voter registration cards go in the mail, they go through a process, and it takes about a month to become a registered voter. If we turn in our petitions on time, our registered voters won't be on the computer at the register of voters by the time the petitions are, are handled. So they actually cut us a little slack here. If we write that number across these two columns, 421770, don't worry about the line in the middle, just write it right there next to where they uh, uh, signed the petition, they will actually give us the benefit of the doubt. And say, okay, there's an affidavit out there somewhere that matches this petition, we're going to allow that. So that is a very, very short training on the logistics of gathering signatures.